uh, hematology. Hematology is kind of divided in, if I can say, the non-cancers. The non-cancers are coming at the end. And the, uh, the uh, well, sorry, the non-cancer stuff, the anemias, will come up first. Then the cancer parts will come up second. So there's almost two parts to this. To start off with the bread and butter is anemia. We all have to have an approach to, you know, to talking about anemia itself. The boards will not ask you, for the most part, what is the normal range. You know, if you're trying to remember factoids for the boards, they won't ask you that. They'll give you references. So when they ask you what like, a normal hemoglobin for a male is, they'll say 14 to 16. They'll give you an index that you look at. So if you're trying to remember a lot of facts, get them out of your brain, because that's what they figure your iPod's for, or you know, it's something that you can look it up in a book. In the future, what the boards actually want to go over to is actually pretend there's a patient right in front of you and see what your thinking ability is, your thinking ability. They can't do that in a, in a test, a multiple guess test. <laughs> so um, they're trying to migrate in, into the thought processes. But there is definitions of what anemia means for males, for females. It's this you know, sexual difference probably based on the testosterone itself. That's why occasionally when we get down to older people, you'll actually see older people, with, uh, the guys with hemoglobins are otherwise very healthy with extensive evaluations with a hemoglobin of 13, 12 and a half, and they're fine. They're either, either anemic or chronic disease um, or they're just normal. The children age-specific hemoglobins will be covered in pediatrics more, but you definitely got to understand that there's differences. A 10 and a half for a hemoglobin for a six-month-old is probably absolutely fine. A 10 and a half for an adult, you're about four standard deviations away from the normal range. Now, the, uh, you'll see us uh, broadcast the United States Preventive Service Task Force. Um, most of the, probably the board, the AAFM, uh, consider them the gurus in evidence-based medicine. So if, they're going, if there's going to be any conflicting data from major organizations, they won't do it, right? So if the American Diabetic Association says something, the task force says something else, they won't ask you that question because they know there's major differences. But anything that the task force basically says, you probably should be aware of it. And if there's no disagreement, answer it that correct you know, answer uh, to, uh, for them. So the task force says there's probably very little data screening for anemia on almost anybody except for kids. Isn't that interesting? We screen them all the time, but there's no evidence to support that. We screen people that actually, we screen them for secondary identification. I call it secondary prevention. The, the, the adults are on non-steroidals. Well, you're screening because you gave them a drug, you know, that could cause anemia. But there's really no data screening adults or the geriatric po uh, population without symptoms or without appropriate medications does any good. Uh, when you look at anemia, you can look at it two different ways, one based on the cause and one, the, uh, one uh, is the way the red blood cells look. We're going to cover both. But if you look at the based on the cause itself, you actually have decreased, pro you know, there's only a couple areas, right? And we'll cover them. It's actually quite simple. Um, the decreased production, it lacks the ingredients. It doesn't have the right food. The most common food that the blood cells need is iron, B12, and folate, and iron is a big one. Um, the, so the decreased production, not enough food, or it could be a bone marrow problem primarily, right? And we'll cover the mild dysplasia, the aplastic anemias, and tumors. Anything that's infiltrating the bone marrow can make the factory shut down. Or suppression of a normal bone marrow by, I call it the innocent bystander. You gave, you gave the person septra for a month or two months for the chronic prostatitis and all of a sudden they become anemic. So now you're shutting down the bone marrow. The drug is making them do that, innocent bystander. That's where your chemotherapy agents end up working, cancer treatments, irradiation, you're shutting down the bone marrow. Or you could have increased destruction. Right? I mean, there's, again, there's only so, 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 uh, so many ways they become anemic. Increased destruction. We cover the hemolytic anemias. The most common hereditary one is hereditary spherocytosis. If we ask this audience, probably about 5% of you actually have somebody that you know or are taking care of having this one. And the acquired ones, the warm and the cold autoimmune hemolytic anemias, will cover. Or you could lose it. You know, losing it, the GI blood loss, the uterine blood loss, you know, from having menstrual cycles or traumatic blood loss. There's, those are really the only ways you could lose your blood. You know, if you think that simple, and I think a lot of times we forget to think this out. When the boards are giving you a, a, a case in hematology, read the case. They'll tell you right what's going on. They won't make it so obvious 
because um, they'll say everybody will get it right. You know, they have to separate the flunkies from the passies, but they'll give you a case. And one way to consider the anemia is based on its cause. The other way, now, once they give you anemia, you can look at morphology. Morphology is one of the easiest ways to actually kind of identify what the cause is. I find that quite interesting. Put them in three categories, small cells, normal cells, large cells, you know, microcytic, macrocytic, and normocytic anemias. So if we start off with one of the more common ones, the, macro, the microcytic anemia, I gave you four different ones on this slide, right? The most common ones will be iron deficiency and anemia chronic disease. The hemoglobin, once you exclude those two, you know, remember the family practice way? You know, our differential is about two different things, and after that we have to kind of go back and think about things. We do that on purpose because usually you're about 95% right after the first two things. But if you're not right, if it doesn't fit, you've got to keep on looking. And that's where we go, the hemoglobinopathies, the sideroblastic anemias, the lead poisonings. They're all in the microcytic anemias. Anemia chronic disease is the tricky character over here, and we'll have some slides specifically on there. But if you look at iron deficiency and anemia chronic disease, look at that. The serum iron, the TIBC, and the ferritin could be exactly the same. That's tricky. So you have to kind of put it together in this scenario. If it's not one of those top two, hemoglobinopathies come way up high in the list. Sideroblastic anemia is a pimp question type of a thing. Get it wrong and just move on because that will probably be less than 99.9% of the microcytic anemias are the sideroblastics, and that basically will require bone marrow. So iron deficiency anemia is the most common reason why you have you know, microcytic anemia. We already know that the causes are probably blood loss, right? blood loss, and most likely GI, menstrual, or OB. A common one is that they'll give you somebody in the 30s, after, you know, 30s that's anemic with microcytic anemia. The whole thing you're looking for is, did they have a normal hemoglobin after childbirth? You know, we all lie when we deliver babies, right? Normal, uh, normal blood loss, and all of a sudden, how did you get down to hemoglobin 7 with a normal blood loss? Unless you take iron probably for six months, you're going to be iron deficient to start off with, then that lady most likely will have menstrual cycles and will still be at the borderline low start, and no one picked it up because they're otherwise so healthy. They only get picked up now when they're sick in the emergency room for some other uh, reason, and they probably had the microcytic anemia for a long time. So we already know the pregnancy and infancy because of the increased demands. 50% of the people have the pica, you know, that you're chewing, you're chewing and crunching on stuff that you probably shouldn't be eating, you know, and no one knows the reason for that. Some people end up thinking, um, and again, they won't ask you this stuff, what is the reason for pica? They're not going to ask you that. You've got to know what pica is, and then they'll, but the, what some people think is chewing on clay, you're getting iron. You know, by chewing on these, on, you know, these wacky food items is actually going to give you some iron back in your diet. The most sensitive test is the ferritin. Sensitive. That means that the ferritin's low, most likely you're iron deficient. But ferritin is an acute phase reactant. Ferritin is, comes from the liver. Anything that makes you sick, the ferritin could go up, right? Acute phase reactant could go up with pneumonia, illness, cellulitis, rheumatoid, you know, uh, rheumatoid illnesses, collagen vascular, Almost anything can make the ferritin go up. So watch out for a false positive, right? A, fal no, a falsely normalized ferritin. And iron over a TIBC is another way of checking for iron, the saturation index. If it's less than 15%, it's abnormal. If it's between 5 and 15, it's borderline, you know, abnormal. And less than 5, almost always iron deficient. If you have a saturation index less than 5, you're iron deficient. You may have anemia, chronic disease on top of that. But most people like a saturation index greater than 15, you know, 15%. A soluble uh, serum transferrin receptor is kind of now the quick person's way of avoiding the bone marrow. This is a, a chemical receptor in your blood that actually tries to grab on as much iron as possible. If you're iron deficient, this receptor goes up. It goes up, trying to grab onto whatever iron it, it, it sees, then deliver it to, you know, whatever, uh, wherever iron needs to go in the body. So if that test goes up, so some people use that test as a tiebreaker. God, my ferritin is maybe falsely normalized. My saturation index is borderline. I don't know for sure. Should I do a saturation, you know, the soluble transferrin receptor? And if it's elevated, most people will say you could avoid, avoid a bone marrow. If you are iron deficient and you give them the food, your blood count should come up, right? 
If you have a microcytic anemia, a 10, a MCV of 68, you give them adequate iron and they're absorbing it, your hemoglobin should respond quite rapidly. So what I said, your reticulocyte count should go up about, you know, should go up two and a half. Two and a half for a retic count is high. So if you are up to a retic count of 2.2, your bone marrow is producing what it should be doing. Remember the average life, is, uh, the average life of a red blood cell is, let's say, 120 days. So that means you have to replenish your whole system, you know, every 120 days. Well, that's almost 1% a day, isn't it? So an average retic count is like 0.6 to a 1. 2 is working double time already. So that's telling you quite a bit. If you are inpatient and you want to know if they're responding to the iron before then, uh, well, sorry, if you're inpatient and want to know if they're responding, the first test you end up doing is a retic count. That should be elevated within a week. Your hemoglobin should go up about 2 to 3 gram percent over 3 to 4 weeks. You should normalize, depending on how well you start, in a month or two. Then it probably takes another 3 or 4 months of iron therapy to replenish your iron stores. So when the, um, sorry. Now, anemia chronic disease is really the bugaboo on this one. It's some, some people just, uh, including myself, never knew all these little factoids that got us in trouble earlier. Except for blood loss anemia, it is the most common cause of normal cytic anemia. The most common reason. We see it all the time. We sometimes miss it. You end up having the older person that has a hemoglobin of 11, and you try to find out everything else, and you colon them, you EGD them, you did everything else, you don't find anything. Most likely, they have anemia chronic disease. Unfortunately, 40% of the time, you can't find the chronic disease, right? So you look high and low, and they're otherwise healthy, and you said, God, you know, you have anemia, chronic disease. The patient says, what, what chronic disease? I don't know, but that's what they call the illness, right? So you have to explain your way out of this one. But 40% of the time, you don't find the infection. You don't find a cancer. You don't find a collagen vascular. You should be aware. You should look and look appropriately, not, you know, do every test in God's creation for this, but then just call it anemia, chronic disease, and explain your way out. The reason why this one occurs is because the T1 half of the red blood cells is decreased. It's decreased and the bone marrow can't utilize the iron that it sees appropriately and it falls behind. It catches up around 10, 11 gram percent. So when you have anemia, chronic disease, don't you see these you know, hemoglobins 9, 10, 11? They just sit there because their, bo their bone marrow has caught up at that point. They said, I could, I could keep up to about a hemoglobin of 10, but I can't keep up to a hemoglobin of 14. The, uh, the anemia chronic disease can be microcytic. We already talked about that. But when it's microcytic, it's rarely in the 60s, almost never in the 60s. This is where you see instead of MCV of 80 to 88, where whatever your lab has, you see seven, you know, you end up seeing 78. Iron deficiency could get way down there, can't it, in the 60s, and the thalassemias could get down in the 50s. Now, the way you treat this is because the bone marrow can't keep up, it needs a little extra push, a little, and it can't utilize its iron, so it needs extra food. If, if you want to treat anemia chronic disease, give it a push with the erythrocyte stimulating agents and give it extra food called iron, if. Most people are doing quite well at a hemoglobin of 10 and a half, 11. You could make a life a lot easier. Tell them that you have a disease that you can't find and you're doing fine and see them back in six months. Iron. When we talk about anemic chronic disease, remember we can't use the iron, so how does the body utilize iron? There's no way, small way, so for our purposes, there's no way for the body to get rid of excess of iron. Just, it just can't do that. Now, the body stores is not, you know, I just put it down over there. You don't have to memorize that at all, but the body stores are a significant amount of iron. Now, when you end up absorbing iron, you need about a milligram a day. And the body stores are 3,800, you know, for a guy. So it's a tightly regulated system. Now, this low level, this is a kind of a key for you hospital-based people, low levels of serum iron and transferrin saturation in a hospitalized patient is more likely to be anemia, chronic disease than iron deficiency. You see it all the time. Again, no one told me that when I started off. So when you end up seeing people that are sick enough to be hospitalized, right, they may have anemia of acute illness, but you can't call it that one. But their hemoglobin goes down a lot of times. You can just follow them in the hospital. It's either from bloodletting, which is blood loss, but a lot of times it's an anemia of chronic disease. So these iron studies are in hospitalized patients are really not that valuable. And if you take people when they're coming in pretty sick, and you just wait, be patient, be patient, check them in a couple months. A lot of times they normalize with you not doing anything. 
But if you're really short of money, you could have coloned them, you could have EGD'd them, you get a GI consult on them, and you piss away all our American money, right? We'll talk about that in community medicine. <laughs> High levels of ferritin now are also most likely from acute phase reactant. Right? See, they're sick enough to be in the hospital. Thy shall not test things in the hospital for the most part, right? When you're sick, quit digging around a lot of the times. Most common ideology for iron load, blood transfusions. So if you have somebody with ineffective erythropoiesis, they don't want us to be blood doctors, but if somebody's having recurrent transfusions for sickle cell, thalassemias, ineffective erythropoiesis, you're constantly giving them blood transfusions to get them up. The iron is sitting there. So eventually, you're going to get iron overloaded. They're not going to ask you, does it take 20 units of blood, 15 or 20 units of blood? All you really have to know is iron can't get out of the system when it's in. And when you're giving a lot of iron based on blood transfusions or some other fashion, when you're not losing blood, you have to be about worried about iron overload. Iron overload doesn't occur in trauma because you are bleeding out. It only occurs in the ineffective erythropoiesis categories. And then